we bought a house, our very first house. Uh, we held it about three weeks. We cleaned it up real good, emptied it out, and we sold it as is and, and made a pretty good chunk of change, believe it or not, on our very first house. Hey, it's Mark Zimmerman, President and Chief Operating Officer of Renner's Warehouse Houston. Hope you're having a great day. Today we're going to talk about some basic stuff here. This is for the new investor, someone that's thinking about investing. Uh, what always comes up to me, a lot of questions that I get are, hey, you know, what can you share in terms of how do I get started in investing in real estate? So I'm going to cover just real quickly the, the top 10 kind of tips to get started in real estate. These are things that you can do to kind of get going on your uh, real estate journey. And uh, some of it's simplistic, some of it's basic, some of it's common sense, but hopefully it'll help you if you're uh, standing on that diving board and you're thinking about diving off, right? So let's get started. Uh, number one, the number one thing that you want to do uh, when you're going to get started in real estate is you know set your goals. This is so important. Uh, I think that you should both set both your kind of financial and your long-term investment goals. Uh, you've got to say to yourself, okay, I want to get to where I'm earning uh, $5,000 a month in passive income from my rental portfolio. And I'm earning $10,000 a month from my buy, fix up and sells or buys and sells and my wholesale deals or my assignments, whatever those are. Uh, or maybe it's a number. Maybe you want to get to where you own uh, 10 investment properties at some point. That's your, your three-year goal or your one-year goal or your five-year goal. Or maybe it's to buy five investment properties a month. But you really need to think about what your, your goal is, especially financially, uh, when you start thinking about investing in real estate. Um, definitely give yourself a deadline. If you don't have something to work towards a deadline, it's probably not going to happen. So whatever goal you set, make a realistic, what they call those smart, smart goals, uh, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely, I think. Anyway, you want to make sure that they're realistic, right? And that there's a, a time element set there. And then basically, if you come up with, I want to own 10 rental properties in the next 24 months, just start working backwards from there to today. What do you need to do in terms of getting to 10 rental properties over the next 24 months? Break it down by month, and then you'll have a very specific uh, series of steps that will get you to that goal that you're, you're, you're uh, basically striving towards. So number one is set your goals. Now, the second thing I always say is you got to make it a business. If you're going to invest in real estate, you need to take it seriously and you have to understand that this is not a hobby. This is an actual business. Um, one of the things that I would suggest is to go to websites for uh, business planning advice, right? Uh, biggerpockets.com is a great place for a whole bunch of information, biggerpockets.com. And on there, there's some really good information about business planning. Uh, the next thing you'll want to do when you're making it your business is you want to set objectives. Now, these are different from your long-term financial or, or uh, productivity goals. These are, these are more objectives. It can be weekly, daily, monthly, but you need to have a set set of objectives that you're going to achieve. Um, you'll want to be very organized, right, when putting together your business and running your business. And you definitely want to build systems and processes to improve your efficiency. Uh, it's a big mouthful, but trust me, as you start ramping this up and your time becomes more and more limited, you're going to want to be efficient and you want to have people and processes in place, even if that, that people is you, <laughs> to make sure that you have time to get everything done that you need to get done. And I find that if you treat your real estate investment business, even if you're doing it on the side while you're keeping your day job, which is what I would recommend, or however you're approaching it, that you, again, focus on it as a business so that way you can scale it and you'll succeed in that business. So uh, make sure you have a plan, make sure that you set objectives, do a lot of due diligence, and then start moving forward. So that's number two, just have a business mindset when it comes to your real estate investment uh, opportunity that you're getting ready to jump onto. 
Number three, you need to find your niche, right? Um, you will be absolutely overwhelmed with the number of places that you can get involved in real estate and make money from it. It's almost overwhelming. What you can do though is you can start to drill down on all those different opportunities to kind of find your niche and at least start out there. Once you get some experience under your belt, some successes under your belt, some money under your belt, then you can start thinking about diversifying into other different real estate investment you know, opportunities. But at the beginning, just find your niche. You know, just think about, for example, what kind of properties are you interested in? It could be a, a, just a single family standalone home. Maybe you're only interested in multiplexes, little ones like the duplexes and triplexes, or maybe you're only interested in multifamily properties, right? Those are kind of the ways you could go. You could be interested in commercial properties. You could be com interested in, of course, the residential properties I just mentioned. You could want to focus starting out on a lower income properties that you can pick up cheaper where there's a little less risk, right? Or maybe you want to focus on those bread and butter properties that in the greater Houston area is that $150,000 to $250,000 property after repaired value. Maybe you want to focus on that really um, important and also um, desired property in that range. Maybe you want to go for a small multifamily uh, uh, facility or property that's going to run you a little bit more. So you have lots of different opportunities. You can also then decide if you want to be local and what you're going to do in terms of your niche. Maybe you want to break out and make it kind of regional. Maybe you're going to do the Gulf Coast. Or maybe you want to go national. Maybe you want to hit the, the what they call the NFL cities and hit Houston and Denver and Miami and LA. I don't know. So you can see that there's lots of different areas to think about your niche. And so what you'll want to do is you want to think about um, what's going to be the easiest for you to pick up on the quickest. And for me, that would be locally owned properties, residential properties, properties that are in that middle income and maybe some low income just for the risk versus the reward. But that would be me. Find your niche. That's going to really help you out in the long run. The number four, start small. Um, there is absolutely no need to go off and start buying uh, eight to 10 houses your first couple months in business or trying to buy a 30 unit apartment complex right after the bat, bat, right? I would start off small. I would start off with one house, work on it, however you decide to make your end game on that property, and then do it again, rinse and repeat. You can start small and then start to build from there, but it's very important to learn the ropes, right? Before you really start escalating, scaling up, and then, you know, exponentially causing you to have a lot more headaches and a lot more things to learn, a lot more things that can go wrong when you do multiple, multiple properties. So, you know, for us, we bought a house, our very first house. Uh, we held it about three weeks. We cleaned it up real good, emptied it out, and we sold it as is and, and made a pretty good chunk of change, believe it or not, on our very first house. And we did that three times, three more times, until we bought our first house, which was our fifth house, our first house that we actually rehabbed. Now that one, we didn't start off small. It was, a, it was already completely gutted, so it was a huge rehab. But uh, we learned a lot just on the buying and selling process on those first four houses that we sold wholesale right, where we fixed it up. Or, I'm sorry, we bought it, we cleaned it up, but we didn't fix it up and then we sold it. Uh, then, of course, we learned a ton on our first rehab where we actually spent quite a bit of money on that. And that was a, a lesson in itself. So learn the ropes before scaling up. That's all I could really say on that. Uh, and definitely start small. So number five, this is a biggie. Assemble your team, right? Assemble your team. And this is important to do before you buy your first property. I mean, there are so many people that are going to help you out in your journey to be a real estate investor that are going to help you to be successful, right? And you just have to think about who you want to put on your team. I mean, for me, there's a whole bunch of people. Um, it, basically, it's a network of uh, experienced real estate professionals, right, and of various industries that are going to help you out. So, you know, if you're not a licensed realtor, and even if you are, it's kind of nice to, to, to connect with a, a few licensed realtors that are uh, focused on helping investors and they understand the investor market and what we look for in terms of buying properties. Nice to have that contact, especially if you're not a licensed realtor. Um, 
I also think it's very important to have an experienced a real estate accountant, right, that can help you through the purchasing and the tax deductions and all the other good stuff that comes with, you know, owning a rental property or owning, owning a real estate investment property, right? So that's important. Um, you're going to want to network with other investors early on and even before you start. They can be a tremendous source of off-market wholesale deals, right? Where they buy a house, they're not interested in fixing it up. They bought it cheap enough to where there's enough room to sell it to you for them to make some money too. They are a great source of leads. Much better a lot of times in MLS because they haven't made it to MLS and that's just through your relationship, your connection. So you're also going to want to get pre-approved with several lenders, right? Not just long-term lenders if you decide to to keep the property and turn it into a passive income rental property. That's of course going to require a conventional long-term note, but you're also going to want to make friends with a couple short-term what's called hard money investors uh, that can help you take down that property, purchase that property that needs a lot of work that a bank wouldn't loan on and even loan you the repairs. Or maybe you have someone that's got private funds that they'll loan you out of their own, their own funds. And, and of course, uh, collect a percentage on that. Um, so you've got a lot of different uh, people on the lending side that you want to try and connect with, form a relationship with, and, and have them on your team before you make that first offer because you want to have all your ducks in a row when it comes to financing when you're offering on, on houses as an investor. And then the other thing that I would suggest too is uh, if you plan on holding any rental property, uh, there'll become a time very quickly where you're going to probably want to um, add to your team uh, an experienced uh, rental uh, residential rental uh, property manager. Um, I certainly could recommend one, shameless plug, Renters Warehouse Houston, but um, there will come a time, as I learned in my own experience very shortly, where managing your own rental property is not an efficient use of your time and the small amount that you pay to have someone manage your property for you on the rental side will free you up to have time to go out and buy more rental properties and to buy more investment properties that you can fix up and sell and do a whole bunch of other things. So I would definitely add a, a good residential uh, property manager to your team. So that's the fifth kind of tip that I'd recommend is get that team built before you start pulling the trigger on making offers and closing on houses. Now, the sixth thing, uh, the sixth tip for you is do the math, right? Uh, this is very important. Uh, too many times I see people not knowing the numbers and running the numbers and understanding the numbers, right? Um, there's a whole bunch of, of, of money, of, of, of numbers that you should know. Um, you should understand some terms. I think I discussed that in another video on uh, the financial side, but you know, you want to make sure that whatever you're investing is, is a really good investment. You're also going to have to understand that whether or not it's a good investment depends on what your strategy is for that property, right? So if you're buying a property to hold for the next 15 years as a rental property and you're going to let the tenant pay it off, and then in 15 years you have a property that's paid off by the tenant if you put on a 15 or 20 year note, you also have a property now that's appreciated quite a bit over that 15, 20 years. If that's your plan, you could actually pay a little bit more for that property. In fact, if you run the numbers, you can pay almost market price for that property as long as the rents hold up and still make a pretty good yield. And then when you add in the appreciation every year, the year your annual yield plus your appreciation really makes it a good investment. So you could pay more for those properties that you want to hold on to. Now, if you're just going to buy a house, fix it up, and sell it, that's a whole different model, right? Uh, you're going to need to buy that house for a much deeper discount than what you see on the shows on TV. Uh, I never went over 70% of after repaired value, meaning I never got to 70% of the, the value of the house, what it would going to be after I fixed it up, and including the repairs that were needed. Never went over that number, and I would suggest that you don't go over that number too, unless you're in a hot market. And I know there's a lot of different variables. I'm just talking for me, my own little experience. But definitely, you can see how if you're buying a house to buy, fix up, and sell has a different kind of paradigm than property that you're going to hold. Um, if you're going to just get a house under contract, right? to buy, but then you assign that contract to another buyer and you're just making your little assignment fee, well, again, the numbers may be a little different in, in, in terms of what you can pay for that property. Might be a little better. So just think about 
um, whether or not it's a true investment, a good investment. You're going to want to look at things. Uh, for example, if you're going to do a, a rehab and sell, you want to make sure that what you're pri uh, purchasing the price, uh, purchasing the property for, is about no more than 150 times your monthly rent. Uh, if you do that, you're going to be at about an 8% gross yield. Don't forget the appreciation that you get thrown on top of that. But that's about where you should be on the purchase price. And also, think about more than just price. When we first started out, and we were buying six to eight to ten houses a month when we got going, um, we bought a lot of cheap properties. Um, certainly fine for buy, fix, up, and sell but I would maybe not go down that road for rental properties, although I will say I have some friends that have a whole ton of lower income properties and they love them and they're doing well on them. But, you know, think about just where the property is, the neighborhood, uh, think about tenant demand and, and how that tenant man is gonna be in that neighborhood if you're gonna hold the property. Even when you're gonna sell it, think about things that we used to call white elephants. You know, if there's a meat rendering plant right behind the, the back fence of the property, you know, there's things that can affect the price. So just don't look at it and go, wow, it's a cheap, cheap property, I'm gonna buy it. Think about the reasons why it's so cheap. Um, there is a, a video that you can check out, which is called uh, How to Analyze and Finance Deals that I made that you can find uh, that goes into a lot more depth about the math in terms of, uh, you know, what to look for in different terms. So number six, do the math. Uh, number seven, this is great. So true. Plan for the unexpected. Things will go wrong. I promise you. There are going to be things that you don't find when you're analyzing how much the repairs are going to be. You might miss it on what you think the house is truly going to sell for or what it actually sells for when you fix it up. And it might be way different than what you thought when you were doing the deal and buying it as is. Um, you may have paid too much for the money, uh, for the property. Um, there are so many different things that can go wrong on rental properties. Don't forget to add a little something in for vacancies, right? Uh, don't forget to add a little something in every month in your analysis for repairs. Um, just plan for that. And if you're purchasing an older home that you're going to turn into a, a rental property, go ahead and take care of some of the big stuff if it's on the, on the very end of its life. And what I mean by that is if the air conditioning unit is 25 years old and on its last leg, while you can still maybe get financing through your lender for repairs, just go ahead and replace the, the HVAC. You'll be so much happier. Maybe it's got a 20, 25-year-old hot water heater that's rusted and get ready to go. Just replace it. Um, same thing with the roof. Go ahead and take care of those big ticket items when you're buying it. If you can fit it into the model and it still makes sense, so maybe you can go ahead and fund those repairs and not get stuck with something down the road because that's when it gets expensive. So just plan for the unexpected. I can bore you with five hours of stories of, of uh, unexpected things that have happened to me, but that's, uh, that's for a time over a beer somewhere sitting beside each other, and I'm more than willing to do that. Just uh, call me up. <laughs> so... Number eight, do your homework, right? This kind of goes along with do the math. I'm amazed at the number of people that don't do their homework when they are looking at an investment property. You know, you've got to do your research. Do not go on assumptions and don't go with whatever someone else tells you. Believe it or not, someone trying to sell a property might, might be off a little bit on the high end for what the house would be worth if it was fixed up. Yeah, Mark, I think that house is going to sell for $200,000 easy if it's fixed up. Well, in reality, maybe it only is going to sell for $150,000. That can mess you up. Or be aware of this. Again, you're thinking about buying a house, and the seller says, Oh, I ran all the numbers, got a bunch of bids from contractors, and repairs on this house are no more than $6,000. Don't necessarily believe them. What is it? Trust but verify. Bring in your own folks because those repairs may be $12,000. And when you're running the numbers and doing the math, you got to make sure that your numbers are right and correct or the whole thing goes out the window. You know, leverage the web for estimated property value. Uh, leverage your realtor friend if you're not a realtor to run those MLS comps. That's another good way. Uh, if you're not comfortable, hire a local inspector to go by and inspect the house before you buy it. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, close at a title company. Please close at a title company. Buy the title insurance. It's always worth it, especially on investment deals and in older homes. 
close at a title company. If you don't close at a title company, you're going to have an issue. Um, if you're using short-term money, know that they're going to send out their own inspector that's going to confirm your repairs. That can be a nice little second, second look, second eyes as they call it. So at the end of the day, number eight, do your homework. Number nine, I say this from the stage every month at our uh, real estate investing uh, event that we do. We do a, a large monthly networking event in Houston. Um, anyway, and this is something I preach over and over again. Don't quit your day job. There's going to be all these infomercials and all these real estate gurus and all the TV shows that are going to say, quit your day job and get into real estate and make tons of money and don't work too hard and blah, blah, blah. I'm not a fan of that. And trust me, I quit my day job to get into real estate. I bought a We Buy Ugly Houses franchise, bought one of the ones in Houston up in the Woodlands. I quit a very well-paying job in the oil and gas industry in order to do that. Don't think I would have done that if I could go back and redo it, because here's why. If you don't quit your day job, right, you can now buy one property every quarter. Was that four a year? Maybe you flip, fix up and flip all four of those properties. Make an extra twenty, thirty thousand a house, let's say. Well, that's pretty good money, right? Twenty thousand a house four times, that's eighty thousand dollars extra on top of whatever your day job is. Now you've got a pretty good income, right? Number two, if you don't quit your day job, if something happens, you know, an unexpected hot water heater that you got to replace for, you know, twelve hundred dollars. Now you got that money because you got your day job, you got your paycheck coming in. There's a lot less stress doing real estate when you start out by having your day job and doing this on the side. Uh, it's a really good way to grow wealth. Um, it can give you retirement security because if you don't quit your day job, you don't have to sell any of the properties that you purchase in order to eat, right? That's the downside of rental property. If you own rental property, decide to keep a property as a rental property for passive income, which I highly recommend you do, well, that's not going to provi provide you much income. There might be some cash flow every month, a little bit, since you probably have a mortgage associated with it. So that's not going to allow you to, to eat. So what happens is if you quit your day job and start doing real estate full time, you're going to have to sell properties to make money, profit, to pay yourself. And that's going to limit the amount of properties that you can hold. Wouldn't it be better just to hold your, go ahead and keep your day job for next five, 10 years, start buying rental property where you buy one rental property every quarter and you're amassing four rental properties every year and you do that for five years, do that for however long, five years, that would be what, 20 properties after five years. And then in 10 more years after that, if you put them on 15 year notes, they're gonna be completely paid off. That's when your retirement fund kicks in. But Fun is an F-U-N, not F-U-N-D, but it is also a retirement fund in a way. So it's just a great way to minimize the risk of real estate if you have that day job. You'll be working a lot. You'll be running around, but that's okay. That keeps you healthy and keeps you young. So number nine, don't quit your day job. Number 10, my last tip, man, learn everything that you can, right? Be a sponge. You, you got to look before you dive. You got to test the water some. This will help you avoid some major costly mistakes. There are so many places where you can learn and you can learn as you're investing. That's what I like to do. I still read books. I do audio books a couple times a week. I go to a lot of different seminars. I listen to a lot of stuff online. I have people that I follow. You know, I've done this 21 years. I've bought and sold over 400 houses. I still don't know everything at all, right? So learn everything you can, especially at the beginning. You can find articles from reputable websites. Uh, again, biggerpockets.com is a great uh, forum for stuff like that. Uh, you can go to uh, free real estate seminars like the one that we put on every month and uh, talk to real estate investors and maybe find one that can be your mentor, uh, someone that you can lean on and just bug the heck out of and get questions answered. Uh, read lots of books on property investing like I do. Uh, the key really is network, network, network.
right? Networking is your friend. That's where you're going to find good contractors. That's where you're going to find good title companies. That's where you're going to find a good lending company. That's where you're going to find a good insurance person. That's where you're going to find a good CPA. That's where you're going to find a good tax attorney. I mean, you will not believe the number of references for building your team that you're going to get if you network, network, network. Now, number 10 is learn everything you can, but here is the thing that I want to caution you on. I see it again and again and again, and that is uh, analysis paralysis. Are you familiar with the term analysis paralysis? So that basically is people just get paralyzed because they don't jump off the board because they're still trying to learn about the board and learn about the wind and learn about the pool and learn about the water and learn about the correct way to dive in and the correct clothes to wear, the correct swimsuit and the correct goggle. I do, you know. You can cause yourself to have analysis paralysis where you don't pull the trigger. So all I can say is go, right? After you've done the things that we've talked about, you've, and number 10, you've learned a lot, just jump off the board, man. You're gonna learn so much when you do your first deal. Here's the way my dad put it to me 21 years ago when we did our first investment deal I did with my, my business partners. I, I was still a little worried about buying our first house. And my dad said this, What's the worst thing that can happen? Let's say you don't make any money. You're gonna learn so much, it's gonna be worth it not to even make any money. He said, even if you lost $5,000 with what these gurus and mentors charge, a lot of them to help you out, you're gonna get a better education just by doing your first house and losing five grand than you ever would sit in a classroom learning. Not that I'm against sitting in a classroom and learning, not saying that. I'm just saying you're going to learn a lot when you jump off the diving board. So the last tip I would leave you would be just go. Go ahead and jump off the diving board after you've got your team together. You've done the math. You've run the numbers. You've learned a lot. You've spoken to a lot of people. Then jump off the board. Jump off the board. You can do it. Jump off the board. Trust me, you will not regret it. Anyway, I hope this has been helpful. Uh, again, if I can answer any questions or if you need anything, you can always reach out to us at Houston at RentersWarehouse.com. That's Houston at RentersWarehouse.com. Uh, I certainly do appreciate your time. I wish you the best of luck on your real estate journey. And uh, anyway, I'm Mark Zimmerman and I'm out. Thanks for watching, everyone. We really hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please hit the like button and subscribe below.